my name is Jason Rezaian. I'm an opinions writer with the Washington Post. Previously, I was our bureau chief in Tehran uh, until I was arrested along with my wife in our home uh, where I um, was taken to Avin prison and held as a hostage by the Islamic Republic Revolutionary Guard Corps for 544 days. Since my release in 2016, I've been reporting on hostages and wrongfully detained people around the world, a phenomenon that is sadly on the rise in countries like Iran, China, Russia, and now horrifically, as we see, in Gaza. Last year, along with the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C., I launched a commission to look at hostage issues uh, and related topics. It's a completely bipartisan endeavor uh, that I am happy to say is co-chaired by my friend Robert O'Brien and Senator Shaheen, and I want to thank them both for taking a deep interest in this critical issue. I'm joined today by Yevgenia Karamurza, whose husband Vladimir, a democracy advocate and fellow Washington Post contributor, uh, is being held in Russia for standing up to President Putin, and Ambassador Roger Carsons, uh, United States Special Envoy for Hostage Affairs. Thank you both for joining. Thank you. Evgenia, I wonder if you could start by telling us about Vladimir's current circumstances and progress in efforts to win his release. Um, thank you very much for the question from the introduction. And first of all, I would like to say what a privilege it is for me to be here today. Um, last year, Vladimir was recognized as one of the builders of this community, so I know how much this platform means to him and how much it means uh, to him to know that his voice is heard here, that his uh, cause is recognized, and that you stand with him and people like him fighting for freedom, the rule of law, and respect for human rights around the world. Uh, Vladimir has been the opposition to Vladimir Putin since Vladimir Putin came to power. In 1999, actually, as a prime minister, Vladimir Putin put up a memorial plaque to Andropov on the uh, KGB building in downtown Moscow. Andropov was someone who introduced punitive psychiatry in the Soviet Union. That was a person whom Vladimir Putin decided to commemorate. That's when my husband said, yep. This is what uh, we're going to get. Russia will be becoming, yet again, a dictatorship. Since then, Vladimir has been um, constantly fighting this regime. And uh, of course, after the full-scale invasion had been launched, he could not stay away from Russia. He believed that as a Russian politician, he needed to be there to share the risks and challenges faced by Russians back home. He believed that as a Russian politician, he needed to show the example, an example that to give in to fear and intimidation is a choice, always a personal choice that you make. And in April of 2022, he was detained. Uh, he was uh, accused of disseminating knowingly false information about the war in Ukraine, um, for speaking out condemning the war crimes committed by the Russian army there and uh, for uh, calling for a Nuremberg-style tribunal to bring to accountability all those responsible. He was accused of cooperating with an undesirable organization. Anything that has to do with human rights in Russia nowadays is undesirable. He was designated a foreign agent, basically to portray him as a sort of a spy, uh, because uh, the Russian regime wants to show that no one would be opposing the official narrative on their own volition. If you do that, it means that you're being paid. It means that someone out there is trying to uh, damage the Russian Federation as a state, and you are on the payroll of these people. And to top it off, he was accused of high treason for speaking against Vladimir Putin, for calling for targeted Magnitsky sanctions against human rights violators, for calling for the Nuremberg-style tribunal. Uh, well, basically, for all of that, today he is being held in the punitive uh, in the punishment cell of the maximum security prison colony in the middle of Siberia. And he's been sentenced to 25 years of strict regime. 
He's in complete isolation. He has no rights to phone calls, no visitation rights. Our kids have not seen his father since um, April 2022. What can democratic governments, folks that are here today, do for political prisoners like Vladimir and Vladimir that isn't being done already? You know what? Um, when I think about that, uh, I mean, and I've, that's my second day here. And yesterday, I've heard many people voice that very important thing that we need to come to terms with and deal with it. Um, it does not happen in the void. Dictators work together. Hostage taking and imprisoning people for their political views or religious beliefs does not happen in the void. Usually this is the result of years of impunity. In Vladimir Putin's case, 20, almost, almost the, same, um, the same time Vladimir got as his sentence, almost a quarter of a century. And, which means that after years and sometimes decades of um, ignoring or appeasing a dictator, the free world is left to deal with damages, to try to control the damage created by this continuous impunity. And, uh, and that, that process is usually accompanied by all these moral dilemmas about how much we should give in exchange for prisoners, in exchange for hostages. Well, the thing is, maybe if the world had done enough to prevent these regimes, these autocrats, from growing into monsters. That problem, that, those moral dilemmas could have been avoided. So, um, and also when we think about those dilemmas nowadays, when we are faced with the need to control the damages create by these, uh, created by these autocrats, it is important to remember two things. First of all, there is nothing more precious than a human life. And that is the basis for democracy itself. Hence the respect for human rights and freedoms, respect for uh, the rule of law, because at the center of it is the absolute value of human life. And second is that very often there are reasons why these specific people are being targeted, are being taken hostage. In the, in the case of uh, Ukrainian kids stolen by the Putin regime, or those Israeli kids kidnapped by Hamas, we're talking about the Putin regime and a terrorist organization literally trying to destroy these nations' future. And the way in which entire families were tortured and killed in the most atrocious ways proves this point. And uh, in the case of political prisoners, it is those autocrats trying to destroy the alternative. The clear alternative, I very often get this uh, question from audiences when I travel to different um, uh, fora around the world. Is there an alternative to Vladimir Putin? Well, there is an alternative, and he is actively trying to annihilate it. And uh, the, the way it can also be proved is by the fact that um, the most prominent figures like Alexei Navalny or my husband are also often targeted for assassination. Vladimir survived two assassination attacks in the past, in 2015 <clears throat> and 2017, when he was uh, poisoned and ended up both times in a coma with a multiple organ failure and had to relearn how to walk and talk both times. And uh, uh, thanks to an independent investigation by Bellingcat and the Insider, we now know that the same team of assassins in the service of the Russian state, the same team of FSB officers had been following my husband before both attacks that was involved in the poisoning of Alexei Navalny. So this is the active efforts to destroy any alternative that can bring to Russia becoming, even getting a chance at becoming a democracy one day. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Karstens, the current hostage crisis in Gaza is like nothing we've seen before. Hostages from 40 countries, uh, the horrifying use of small children and 
the elderly as potential leverage, hostage takers that aren't a terrorist organization in the classical sense, nor are they a traditional state, but th that enjoy functioning, working relations with both friends and adversaries of the United States. All of these factors underscore the need for something that you and I have discussed often, uh, a multinational, multilateral hostage strategy. What would that look like? And is something like that starting to take shape? So Jason, uh, thanks for that question. Uh, thank you for your leadership uh, and everything you've done since you've come back. You've stayed in the fight. You could have walked away, and yet your, uh, your leadership at CSIS, along with Ambassador Bryan and Senator Shaheen, has been just amazing in taking on some of these hard questions to include the question of deterrence. Uh, and before I answer that, if I may, Peter, thank you for uh, hosting uh, this specific topic here at Halifax. Uh, your team has just done a wonderful job, and we're grateful to discuss this in this forum. Uh, additionally, uh, and this kind of gets into the answer, uh, I'd like to thank Canada for their leadership, not only in hosting us, but in engendering or rather making the declaration against arbitrary detention in state-to-state -state relations in uh, February of 21, uh, a document that now has 75 endorsers due to the great diplomatic work of Canada going around the world and getting countries to, to endorse this important document. The document is an effort to uh, establish a higher, stronger norm against taking uh, hostages in state-to-state -state relations. And it kind of gets into the answer of your question. What would this look like? Uh, I think. Uh, not only is this declaration important because it, it, it in a way points out the obvious that states, nation states and terrorist groups should not use people as bargaining chips, but it also is allowing us to maybe fine tune and focus on building together a multilateral coalition that can use elements of national power in an effort to prevent and deter this effort from ever happening. Uh, I, I know Secretary Blinken uh, very early on put his hand on my shoulder one day after a particularly rough meeting related to hostages. And he said, we've got to come up with a way that this never happens again. Start working on bringing countries together, and in, in his mind, to create an, a NATO 5, uh, Article 5, rather, uh, effort. So when a, a person is taken from a country, that nation state feels compelled, nation states feel compelled to try to help out and work with each other. To that end, we've spent the last two years working with some of our allies and partners around the world to come up with uh, that multilateral coalition. Now, we're still kind of sketching out the, uh, uh, what it's going to look like. Uh, we're working with uh, some very esteemed jurists, lawyers, to try to figure out how we can uh, create the laws that might support that. Um, but at the end of the day, if I could just give you this, and I'll, and I'll turn it back over to you. If the United States can take its elements of national power, diplomacy, information, military, economic, legal, uh, financial, and find tools that it could use and put in the service of trying to prevent and deter hostage taking, and if other countries can do the same, the goal would be that one day a country like Iran would look at a potential target and decide not to take them as a hostage because the price is now too high. All the countries have figured out what, what game's being played and have now banded together to stop that game from being played. We're working on it now. Uh, it's going to take some time, but it's something that I have a full team of three people working on every day. I'm trying to figure out how to make those tools uh, come, come to uh, fruition, working with not only uh, the interagency, but also Capitol Hill, members of Congress, in order to perhaps create the authorizations that are required to put this practice to rest. In the meantime, though, you have dozens of Americans being held in countries around the world. Um, you and I have both uh, been in, in fora like this and, and taken the question over and over again, doesn't negotiating the release of a hostage lead to more hostage taking? No one, fortunately, right now is saying don't uh, negotiate for the release of these 200 plus people in Gaza, and I think that's sort of a game changer in, in how we think about mm -hmm. the issue. Talk about the tough decisions that have to be made um, and, and why, why President Biden has chosen to, to make so many of those tough decisions so far. Uh, yeah, the, the, there's never been a case, at least to my knowledge, and I could also refer to Ambassador Bryan, who had my job before I did. Um, there's never really been a case where you go up to a, a country, a dictatorship, and uh, uh, really advocate for someone's release. You know, I call on you to unconditionally release Jason Resign. It just doesn't work. You usually have to find uh, some sort of accommodation. The decisions that you make are really hard and brutal. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into uh, those courses of action. If, for example, if we have to do something as unpalatable as coming up with a prisoner swap, we'll take a look at the person under US uh, detention 
uh, in, a, in a prison to determine what's their rate of recidivism. You know, what, 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 are they still a threat to U.S. or national security or the national security of our foreign partners were that person to be let out? So we try to make sure that when we do these things, we actually have done all the math to, so that the president gets the, uh, I guess, a, a full sense of what he's, he's buying into. But what I can say that, um, uh, is it worth it? I mean, to my mind, I'm, I'm looking at two examples. You know, uh, uh, Jason, uh, you were held in prison unjustly for quite some time. Your wife was held in prison. You've suffered greatly. And when I see uh, that you're sitting here right now in this leadership role, uh, I can't help but think the United States made the right decision to do what it had to do to bring you home. Yevgenia, you're an example of someone who didn't ask to be here. You did not want to be in this position, and yet here you are. You're here advocating for your husband's release and try to fight, fight this fight as well. You know, I was with Yevgenia um, uh, two nights ago in London when she received the Magnitsky Award for Courage Under Fire for the hard work that she's done. Um, uh, I feel, I, I'll just say it, I feel inspired every time I hear you speak. But again, you didn't ask to be here and deal with this. So what does this come down to? We make hard decisions, and President Biden's made a lot of them. In the time he's, since he's been in office, President Biden's brought back 37 Americans by making a lot of these hard decisions. But the President and the Secretary of State and others have had a chance to meet with these family members. They understand the human toll and, and the cost that an American citizen and family have to, have to endure during these, uh, during these occasions. And uh, when you meet people like Evgenia, when you meet people like Jason Rezaian and have a talk about what they're going through, you can never put yourself in their shoes, but you understand the human toll. And as I think you ind indicated, the individual matters, and bringing people home matters. Families matter. And our job is to, as your government, to find ways to uh, bring those families at back and unite them again. Thank you. I, I could talk to you both all day. We don't have a ton of time. I have one more question for each of you, and I hope we have a little bit of time for audience questions. Uh, Ambassador Carstens, different countries are doing this for different reasons. The motivations for Iran, China, Russia, Venezuela, Syria, and others aren't the same. So will we need specialized deterrence approaches uh, when the time comes? Yeah, I think you will. That's a great question. When I took this job, I went to see my two predecessors, Jim O'Brien and then Robert O'Brien. And uh, both of them said the same thing, and that is there is no playbook for this. There's no cookie cutter. You have to, he goes, you think there is? You're gonna spend time looking for it? But they were both right, and uh, there is no cookie cutter approach. I can say overall, does Iran usually want uh, bags of money? Probably I could say overall. Is Russia usually more interested in prisoner swaps? I'd say, yeah, probably overall. And yet each case comes down to engaging with the other side, really trying to pick apart what it is to get the job done and then, and then finding a way to make it happen, not only on their side, but also within the US government. So will it come down to individual um, efforts? It will. Can we still, however, through a good deterrence and prevention effort, find these tools that can stop nation states from doing it? I think we can. We have a lot of hard work ahead of us. You know this isn't easy. Thank you. Uh, Evgenia, in the past, the sort of public efforts to raise awareness and win the release of a political prisoner like Vladimir they usually work and more quickly uh, than they are these days. What does that say about the strength or weaknesses of democratic and civil society institutions in the West in the face of authoritarians who probably in the past would have bent to public pressure? Um, well, I, first of all, I want to thank Ambassador Carson for uh, saying what he did. Um, about how it is important to find the ways to prevent such practices from being used. Because although it is absolutely crucial to solve the existing cases, because again, human, there is nothing more valuable than a human life, and because this is what democracies are based on, the respect for that value. Um, but it is also crucially important to democracies to find to find ways to protect themselves and protect their values. Because autocrats work together, they learn from each other, they adopt each other's practices, they share their knowledge in how more and more evil they can be. And democracies are left to watch in shock and, so, uh, and, and, control, and try to control the damage. So the ultimate goal of such 
cooperation between democracies that sh who should also bring their efforts together should be to prevent, to find ways to prevent such practices from being used in the first place. And one, um, I think, uh, one important um, part of it would be to return to the, um, to, to the notion of goodwill and standing for what is right. Many Soviet dissidents were released thanks to the advocacy of US presence of both parties. Uh, I am blessed to be acquainted with uh, Honorable Professor Erwin Kotler, the amazing human rights defender who fought for many dissidents and political prisoners around the world, including Nelson Mandela, Natan Sheransky, and now my husband. Uh, I know that behind all this advocacy by US presidents, by people like Professor Kotler, there was this, not just goodwill, but the, uh, the understanding of how important it is to stand for what's right. Because that sends a powerful message to those autocrats that the free world knows the nature of these regimes. It knows why these people are being prosecuted, persecuted, and it's going to stand with them to show to the world that the world can be better. It's like, for example, showing to Vladimir Putin that you see that he's trying to destroy the alternative and you're going to fight for that alternative. You're going to stand for this alternative because, well, in the end, it's, uh, it's actually going to be pretty nice to everyone to see Russia democracy, right? That is the only way to Russia to stop being a threat to itself and everyone else, is for it to become a democracy. This is why the regime is trying to destroy this democratic alternative. Because, of course, it wants to continue waging the war and oppressing its population. And that is the only way Vladimir Putin can stay in power. So do not give in to that. Stand with those who do fight who represent a different face of Russia, who know, who know that there is this chance for our country. And my husband has always, I mean, you know, he twice the guy had to relearn how to walk. And I remember in 2015, it took him over a year to get back to normal. He was walking with a cane, but as soon as he was on his feet, he packed his bags and went back to Russia to continue his fight. And I was looking at him and I was thinking, well, it's just the wind's gonna carry him away like Mary Poppins. He was wobbling with his cane and yet he refused to give up. So do not give up on us, do not. There is a different Russia. My husband is a different Russia. I am a different Russia. I know what I'm fighting for, not just my husband. And, you know, recently uh, an artist and a pacifist, Alexander Skorchelenko, was sentenced to seven years in prison for switching price tags at a local supermarket with anti-war messages. And at the same time, the murderer of Anna Politkovska was pardoned by Putin. <coughs> two Russian citizens, two different Russias, stand with the one we all want to see, please. Thank you. Thank you very much.